the Word of God, according to the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 10, 35 and following. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And ever, whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our redeemer. Amen. In December of 1988, I believe it was the 7th, in northwest Armenia, they had an earthquake that killed in four minutes 35,000 people in four minutes. Country was devastated at that tragedy. There was a, a young man by the name of Armand in school that day when the school collapsed. Now I heard Charles Swindoll tell this story back in uh, 1993. And so I hope I get the details correct. It's been a while since I've heard Charles. But as he told the story, Armand told the other children that survived with him in this cave, in this pocket, when the school fell around him, the desks and the furniture and even the walls formed a pocket where the debris landed on top of, and over a dozen children survived. But Armand told the children, my father, if he's alive, will come and rescue me, because he said he will always be there for me when I need him. And if my father is alive, he will rescue me, and if he rescues me, he'll rescue you too. You just stay with me. And the townspeople gathered at the side of the school and there was great weeping and wailing and the parents started talking about their children who had died in this tragedy. But the father of Armand started throwing bricks off the pile and they told him there's no use, everybody is dead. And he said, I told my son I would always be there for him if he needed me. My son needs me. I will not stop until I know if my boy is alive or dead. And he kept throwing off rocks and bricks and lumber and debris and nobody joined him. And he worked for eight and then 12 and then 16, and then 24, and then 36 hours. And finally, at 38 hours of digging debris where he figured his son's classroom would be, he heard noise and he started yelling, Armand, Armand. And 
a voice came back, Dad, it's Armand. I knew you would be there for me. The other children were scared, but I told them, Dad, that you would always be there for me and that they would be safe if they stayed with me. And you rescue them first, Dad, because they're scared. But I know you'll always be there for me. He believed. And in his belief had hope. And in hope encouraged others. Why the cross? We have here today the third and final prediction of the cross in Matthew's gospel. And it's the most significant thing I can imagine presenting not only to you, but to the entire world. Why the cross? When Mark predicts the cross, there's this, there's this pattern that he uses when he predicts the cross. And it's, it's the very telling. The, the starting and the finishing of the three predictions of the cross are around blind men being healed. The first man, he doesn't heal immediately. When he makes spit and mud from the dirt with his spit and puts it on the man's eyes, he asks the man, what do you see? And the man says, I see men as trees walking and has to touch him a second time. It's the only story I know where Jesus has to touch the fella twice in order for the healing to take place. But then at the second healing of a blind man, Bartimaeus, after the third prediction of the cross, Jesus just heals him. Bam, what happened? He got closer to the cross. And the closer he came to the cross, and the more he proclaimed his obedience to the Father, the more power he had. I once was blind, but now I see. We know those words from the hymn, Amazing Grace. But I tell you, Mark is the one who started that. Because he wants us to see that the salvation is in the cross. There's three predictions, and there's this ordering. Let me read it to you. Three predictions of the cross. There's a chart here that I have. First of all, Jesus heals a blind man, and that's the one I told you where he had to touch him twice. And he makes then his first prediction of the cross. Then Peter puts his foot in his mouth. Thou art the Christ. No, you're not going to the cross. Y'all remember that one. God forbid. And Jesus makes the second prediction of the cross. The disciples put their feet collectively in their mouths. We heard that when they tried to make the little ones go away. And Jesus said, you know, that's how the kingdom is. These little ones demonstrate what the kingdom is like. Unless you receive as a little child, you'll never enter in. And then he makes a prediction of the cross. This third and final prediction of a cross. And then James and John put their feet in his mouth and Jesus heals Bartimaeus. Can I give you more context? Just a bit more. Verse 32 comes before verse 35. I don't care what modern math says, that's still the way I was trained. Verse 32, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. Now you see Mark is a travelogue, and where they are and where they're going tells you what's going on in the story. Where are they going? They're going up. Where are they going up to? To Jerusalem. However you get to Jerusalem, you're going up to get there because it's a city set on a hill. And they were going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. 
And after three days he will rise again. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Do you hear how silly that is? He's talking torture. And they're talking prominence, preeminence, to sit at the left hand, to sit at the right. The gospel of the kingdom of God is antithetical, totally opposite what we understand as kingdoms from this world. Be they the Roman Empire, you know why Jesus was killed, the sign told you, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Rome says we're going to kill any king that stands against our might. Or be it his own disciples. He says, this is going to happen to me. Ooh, 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 I want to be in charge. I want to be a boss. I want to be ahead of everybody else. And when the ten hear it, they get ticked because they think James and John are getting ahead of them. Why the cross? Because to go up, you go down. To get strength, you become weak. Jesus makes predictions of the cross three times, and this one that I read to you just now is the most detailed of the three. But they're always linked, the cross, to our salvation. What happens to Jesus is connected to us in our faith and in our baptism. If you believe that, would you say amen? amen. All right. What happens to Jesus connected to us? But what about us? The Apostle Paul was given a thorn in the flesh to keep from becoming conceited. Second Corinthians, he speaks of having received this vision and it was too great to speak about, but he's given a thorn in the flesh so that he didn't get swelled up, puffed up. And he asked God that this thorn in the flesh be removed. And what did God say? My grace is sufficient for you. But now this, this second part, let me read it to you. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is is made perfect in weakness. Now that's what God says to Paul. Wonder if that wasn't somehow connected with what the Father said to the Son. My power is made perfect in weakness. And it's like Jesus in his own cave, like Armand's cave, telling those around him, Daddy's coming. Daddy's going to save me. And when Daddy saves me, Daddy's going to save you too. You just believe. Daddy keeps his promises. Or as Jesus said in Matthew 28, I'll be with you always, even to the very end of the ages. How in the world do we come up with the cross it is the ultimate obedience that buys our salvation. Sin entered the world through disobedience. And the solution is obedience, but not just mild obedience. Not just obedience to a certain length, but even to death. Death on a cross, as Philippians 2 says. Even that extreme. And he describes today the spitting, the mocking, the beating, the crucifixion. You know why Rome crucified? It was the most painful, humiliating possible death they were able to come up with. And they kept him up on that cross until the body decayed, except Jesus came down. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentile lord it 
over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, we ask your Holy Spirit's presence to help us, even if we don't completely understand why the cross, to understand that you considered it a requirement to reverse the curse of sin and death. And then in faith with Christ, joined with him in baptism, we wait for your promise to be fulfilled in us. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is found on page six.